Hey, everybody. Uh, you did, it was close enough, Lewandowski, but uh, I'll, I'll let the W's go, that's cool. Um, I'm hoping this uh, talk is uh, all about friendliness, because we've just heard about unfriendliness of Git, and um, I'm going to be talking a little bit about that kind of designer-developer crossover point, um, and particularly in my case, what happens if they're not just in the same room, but in the same person. Um, because I've got a background in uh, running a design agency, I ran one for a good few years, um, but my degree was in computer science, so basically my career has been this kind of flip-flopping between design and um, writing code, and actually over the last few years I've discovered that they're more or less the same thing in the practice that I've developed, um, which is around startup studios, so um, organizations and companies that are set up specifically to invent other companies, which is a bit of a strange meta idea, but that's kind of what I'll be talking about today. Um, the, the way I like to think about this is, oh, go on, wrong one, is it? That's a shame, oh well. Uh, oh, it's completely frozen, okay. Let's have a look. Oh, there we go, it's fine. Um, sketching to the future. So the, the kind of way that I think about um, my process that I've developed over the last few years um, is that I'm often sketching around. Um, I'm there with my Git branches all over my computer with loads of different experiments and loads of different things I'm playing with at any one time. And um, sketching is very different to engineering. Um, so the way that I kind of liken this in the code that I write and the experiments and things that I make, um, it's like I I have a very, very active uh, artist sketchbook that's in code, um, that that's kind of what I have to one side, before I then develop things that actually users use. And I think this is something that I, I'm probably is very familiar to all of you nowadays working in user experience, that you can get a long way with like drawing out these static uh, imaginations of the future for a user, but at some point, you're going to have to prototype something that moves and have to prototype an interaction. And I guess that's the area that I find really interesting, and that will be the kind of focus of what I'll be talking about. Um, Anybody, is there anybody in the room who would describe themselves as a T-shaped person? Have you heard this before? I think I'm amongst friends here. Um, the, the idea of a T-shaped person, um, I th and you probably find this quite familiar, I hope, because um, it's, it's a, a way of looking at the level of skill you have in different areas of your discipline. Um, and T-shaped people have a kind of relatively very thin layer across lots of different areas of interest, and then have one kind of deep area of skill that they've developed over a long time. And the, um, the a T-shaped person, you probably look at them as being the product manager. Um, they're someone who has to ha understand uh, all different uh, parts of a product or a startup, uh, like psychology, the way the code works, where the process works with the team, all sorts of different things. And I guess I'm one of those. I'm kind of not very good at a lot of things and good at one or two things. Um, and I think user experience um, is one of those areas, much like um, philosophy or economics. It's kind of everything, uh, if you think about it. Um, I'll, uh, I'll leave that one there to think about. But we heard um, one of the speakers earlier, Nick, said, um, oh, he's looking for a full-stack developer. Well, I guess that's me. I'm a, I'm a full-stacker. Um, I... I've spent a long time um, writing code that users experience by you know, logging in and touching things on a screen, and all the way back to kind of databases and using um, other third-party tools and plugging it all together in the back end. Um, and that's what we often think about as a full-stack developer. So my T in that T shape is this kind of, uh, kind of deep area of, of code and understanding of how code works. Um, but the stack is always bigger than that. So anyone ever tells you they're a full stack developer, they probably haven't realized there's some other stuff on the, st on the top here uh, around branding and marketing and uh, user experience. So um, one of the problems with being a T-shaped person to, um, and being in kind of user experience is that everything is interesting. There was so much that you could put into your work and so many experiments you could play with. Um, how do you choose where to focus? Um, and uh, I guess, my, my curse for my career has been this. It's going to wake up in the morning and I think, oh my gosh, isn't everything so exciting? I can just try this other thing. Maybe I should start a record label. Um, I did. Um, <laughs> I've done lots of stuff like that. Um, and uh, with, with, with all these tools available to us all the time and this vast internet, 
one of the biggest things we all have to decide as people is like, where do you focus your energy and what do you do with your time? Um, and I guess if you're looking at me as an example of how to spend your time, I probably wouldn't follow my path because I've done too many little tiny things. And I wanted to talk to you about that and then on to how I found myself doing what I do for a living. So it started with this woman. Um, anyone know who she is? Vivian Westwood, awesome. I'm with the right crowd here, this is good. Um, Vivian Westwood um, took a chance on me uh, when I was running my little agency. There were two of us in the back room of a house in South Birmingham. Um, and somehow we managed to land the gig building her entire website for the next six years. Um, and it was just two of us in a room, I'm serious. It was like me writing PHP and, uh, and doing all the design, and, and my friend was like running the business and making it all work from that point of view. Um, but what, what I remember from working with her was this one moment where she was standing next to a photocopier when we were visiting, and she was just drawing out on a piece of paper and then putting it on the, on the photocopier and printing out 50 times and distributing the 50 pieces of paper around her team. And she was basically leading the entire company just by sketching stuff out. Oh, I've got this idea, it's like this. And then distributing it, and then the dresses would just come out. It's absolutely amazing to watch. Um, so basically what I've spent my last few years doing are these little sketches, except my medium is code. Uh, it's a bit abstract, so I thought I'd give you some examples, and hopefully these are ones that you might find interesting rather than worky ones. Um, um, has anyone ever typed uh, a domain wrong into a browser? Um, I did, and unfortunately for The Guardian, they'd um, rebranded and bought theguardian.com as their new domain name and forgotten the proper internet spelling of the. Um, so I registered it, and if you do this on your phone, <laughs> maybe not now, I might take the server offline, um, but you basically type it in wrong, teguardian.com, and you get their website, except on every single page of the site, I've inserted five typographical or grammatical errors. Um, why did you do that, Steph? Um, I don't know, it was a hack day, it was fun. Um, <laughs> It was, I was working with Bill, who used to host The Guardian on his uh, desk uh, back in the day, and we thought it'd be a laugh. And the thing is, that it was a ridiculous, pointless kind of little play, play toy. Um, but then afterwards, I met one of the guys who did product to The Guardian, and he said, it was great, because actually, if you think about it, that's a great way of teaching people how to spot those errors on a page, like it could be a little game. So now you can actually press a button to reveal where they are, and maybe there's a, a, a useful tool for kind of teaching interns how to copy check on your website or something. I didn't take it any further, but that's the kind of thing I mean by these little sketches. You knock it up in a couple of hours, and then you have a conversation around it, and maybe something can come from it. You haven't really lost anything, you have some fun. Another one um, I did in collaboration with an artist, uh, Liz Burial Page, um, is this. It's called the Crypto Quilt. Um, and it's, uh, we came up with this visual way of representing um, uh, letters and numbers in the form of these triangles, these colored triangles. And we encoded an extremely personal family secret into uh, an encrypted version of some text and then encoded it as a quilt. And then we put the password to the uh, encryption in her will. <laughs> so what did you do on Saturday? <laughs> Um, so at some point um, in the long distant future, um, the family will be able to decode this because it's easily de decryptable just by going to our website. This is cryptographics.io. Uh, Again, entirely pointless. It's more like a work of art uh, than anything. It's just uh, something we did together. It was fun. It was, it, was, it was kind of flexing some muscles. But it does get serious, this process. I, I'm constantly doing these things, and I'm not alone. There's lots of people who go to hack days and have fun doing this stuff. Um, and uh, one day, I was doing something similar, just with adding comments on the bottom of a YouTube video so I could search around it to find a particular moment where something happened. Um, and it turns out that that's the kind of thing you can pitch to some angel investors and you can build a business out of. So we, from a tiny little prototype like that, we built up a company of, I don't know, 40-odd people at the peak um, and raised a lot of money behind it to do so. And, and it came from an, an inkling, a little inkling about something I couldn't do, some experience that was missing a user experience that was there, like a hole that we could fill, and that turned into a backable company. Um, I've since left there, I no longer work at that company, but um, this is my new one, um, and uh, it's really simple. It's, a, it's a, a color visualization of your recent Instagram feed. I made this um, in an afternoon or something, and c continued playing with it over a few days period. Um, I'm amazed by these things because 
If I look back at what I learned in the first, what I earned in the first year of my career, basically this little visualization I made has brought in as much as my first year of salary in the industry um, in the last few months as um, as it was back then. So. It's amazing what you can make from these tiny little things, and I call them ephemerals. Um, uh, they're little beautiful user experiences that, you know, a bit of joy in there, a bit of fun, but then maybe there's some, uh, something applicable in there with the business backing to it, but maybe they're throwaway. You know, maybe just ditch it. It doesn't matter. Um, and I, I don't know, if you've been working in the web or apps as long as I have, like, so, like, I leave a trail of these things we've made on the internet behind us, and they just evaporate. They're just um, ephemera. So, um, that's all great. How do you make a living um, making little ephemerals? Well, you, you probably don't. Um, you probably have to focus and build something of value. And that's the kind of constant tension of the kind of hacker um, approach to making these little experiments all the time. In that if you were to give any advice to someone who's playing around, uh, at some point you have to pick something you're going to invest in and grow. And that's the second part I want to talk about here, because um, I want to give you that background to why I'm doing what I do, so you understand. But now I want to give you some big picture stuff on some trends that are going on uh, about companies are using this approach, but a kind of macro scale. So we're going to scale up a bit bigger now. Um, big company, WhatsApp. Um, and we kind of forget how, how these guys came out of nowhere. Um, you know, um, a few years ago, not really not so long ago, um, I dug out, dug out this graph. This um, is from the FT, and it was looking at what was happening around um, SMS messages and WhatsApp. Uh, this was before they sold and everything. And this is the graph of WhatsApp usage over those three years. And then, the, oh, you can't quite see the gray there, but this was pre-14. And it was, oh, it looks like it's going to overtake. That has been absolutely smashed since. And if you think about the companies that were uh, competitors to WhatsApp, it was all the phone companies. It was, you know, all the, the operators. They were responsible for that really valuable messaging sector. And then out of nowhere, this startup with 50 people working on it completely owned the, one of their big sources of income. So if you were sitting on the board of a company looking at this graph, you'd be pretty scared back then. Um, I'll carry on with the theme of being scared. Um, we won't stay for too long. But Kodak, um, another classic. They, these guys were the, on the opposite end of that spectrum. A big incumbent that had been making um, uh, film and cameras for a long time, kind of resting on their laurels. Um, and a, another graph. Um, there's not too many graphs in this, I promise. But you can see, like, when they, in the inception of the company, they're just in steady growth, steady growth, steady growth. And if you're in 2000 and you're on the board of directors of Kodak, you're like, what's the problem? There's no issue. And we all know the story here. Well, maybe you don't, but they actually had the opportunity to own digital um, photography. They had, a, in their team, they had an R&D department working on making digital cameras, and they decided not to, fo not to follow through with it. And you can see what happened after that. The number of analog photographs just dropped. The digital uh, basically took over, and that was in 2011. It's now three trillion a year. Um, so Kodak missed the boat. And if we talk about um, kind of software eating the world, you know, we've got Amazon just jumping in on all these opportunities, um, and they're really scaling up because they do pay attention to these trends. Um, there's a quote here by um, uh, the ex-CEO of Cisco. Um, that kind of distills down what I think is the, the fear of the mega corporation. Um, and he gave this talk where he gathered all of his um, customers together. This is his customers in a room. Um, and he said, I'm sorry, but you're basically all going to go bust if you don't do something. Because uh, he saw a big trend coming uh, where these tiny little um, uh, startups within three years would just come along and make huge dents into uh, big, big brand names, and they would start evaporating. And we're starting to see that. Um, and, you know, these guys, oh, there's no GIF. Never mind. Oh, there we go. We've got a, we've got a GIF. I love this GIF. Um, it's just mind-blowing for them. You're like, oh, my goodness. We, we're here. We've got our work. We've got our industry. Um, and then out of nowhere, there are going to be these really sudden unicorns. And uh, I'm not a big fan of the, uh, the term, but... Um, it's true, these tiny little businesses, you know, with handfuls of employees uh, commanding huge valuations coming out of nowhere and really, t really making dents in the, big, in the big companies. And particularly if you look at a few trends, I'm not going to go into t too many of them because I'm sure you're, you know, you're following all the kind of tech and future news and everything. Um, 
But I am really interested in what's going on with uh, particularly artificial intelligence and machine learning, um, because that has real potential to hit a lot of different sectors simultaneously, and particularly service businesses, um, banking, anything involving kind of human interaction that's repetitive has potential for being disrupted. Um, so things, things are going to get a bit weird, uh, really. I think uh, a lot of big companies might disappear, brand names we're familiar with might I might have to react uh, pretty rapidly to very small new entrants coming in. Um, I feel sorry for them, really. Um, um, so what do we do about all this? Um, do we look at it as a kind of dangerous scenario where we, you know, we as people having jobs are going to be uh, worried and potentially going to uh, be unemployed from what we're doing at the moment? Is the change going to be a bit too rapid for us? Or is it an opportunity? Um, and I think uh, this, I think, I would say represents the opportunity for kind of user experience agencies here because um, uh, I think we have potential to take advantage of these uh, trends and for you guys to actually um, play a big part in helping those big companies um, fend off some of this uh, competition. Um, and that's the next part I'm going to talk about. Um, there's a, a kind of growing move to these, um, these big guys, the, the, the large corporates of the world, um, starting to think that maybe um, they, uh, rather than having this one sure path they're going down in, in their strategy, uh, to actually entertain the idea that perhaps they should be investing in things that are directly opposed to what their main business is about. Um, which is a bit of double think for the for the boards. Um, so th this this word of d disrupt uh, seems to be kind of floating around a lot more. Um, I, personally, I'm kind of bored with the word. Um, I hear it too much, and I've heard it for too long. Um, but bear in mind that we're at kind of the forefront of of these things. We you know we're the early adopters of the world. Um, and this word disruption um, is is kind of common in our industry. But for the large corporates, you know, they might not even heard of some of the things that we are constantly using and aware of in our day-to-day -day work. Um, so it might seem like old news, um, but actually the, uh, the new news is there are new forms of uh, approach that the, the corporates are taking. But it's all based on um, uh, a premise, um, a premise that's failed, I think. Um, so if you're working with a design agency or a user experience agency or a consulting business, uh, you might have heard this mentioned in a meeting. Um, we need to innovate like a startup. Um, so the, this, the, the premise here is that you can get a big company to avoid this um, attack from all sides by these small competitors uh, by getting the big company to behave like them. Um, it sounds great on paper, and I'm sure it adds a few zeros on your consulting fees. Um, I've certainly seen it, seen it firsthand. Uh, you start pitching this kind of thing, it's very different from pitching an app or a website or you know, um, all the other things that we try to sell to the, the kind of big brands of the world. This is more fundamental, and there's a real uh, pain at the other end that you can point to and say, well, if you don't innovate like a startup, then you, know, you might get uh, disrupted, and then you know, your job might be toast. So they get, they get a bit scared. It's a good motivator. But this has been banded around for a few years now, and I think it's losing its luster, really, and mainly because of three things. Um, uh, I've, I've invented some words for you. Um, Bagile. <laughs> yes. yes. <laughs> And we all know, I don't think I need to explain what I mean here. Like, you've seen it in action, um, the, the, the kind of cherry picking of terms and approaches from these um, uh, methodologies that we've spent a long time developing as people and businesses, um, and kind of cherry picking the, work, the bits that work within the corporate environment and ignoring the bits that don't. And you end up with a slightly kind of mismatched uh, what a set of expectations about how a project might run and how things are conducted. Um, and I think the uh, I think the, the co corporates are, are getting a lot better at this, and you have these um, uh, groups now forming where they they have good agile processes. But just tacking on some agile into a corporate environment where the um, where the lines of command are um, just just, not, just misaligned with that approach, you can end up in some trouble and some uh, friction. Um, so that's the second point, uh, infrastructure. <laughs> um, so that one of the amazing things about doing a project with a big company is they have vast resources. Um, and so if 
so as an example, I did a big, um, a biggest project with Red Bull where we kind of pitched this idea. I was working at a studio, um, and we had the idea that we could build a kind of social network around BMX and skateboard video. Um, and we spent the summer riding, skate, uh, riding BMXs and skating around and videoing ourselves. We made this app, and the idea was that we would then be able to lever all of the kind of resources that Red Bull had behind them to make this amazing kind of social network happen. Um, but you run into this, these issues where actually that's kind of impossible because the organization isn't set up to run that quickly or to run with the same um, uh, approaches. So you, you can't make a decision and then just go with it the next day because you're not the CEO. You're not in charge of your own destiny, like a, like a startup breaks down because you've got to pitch to someone and get their approval, and they have to get approval, and then the, the, you just get condensed down. You can't move fast enough. Um, so then you end up with the third word, and I'll stop here, um, entrepreneur. Um, there's entrepreneurs and intrapreneurs. Um, both are valid approaches to inventing things. Um, but I think that... Um, Entrepreneurs have a very different mindset to entrepreneurs. And, and the attention of an entrepreneur is to invent a kind of business, a line of business, something that works within the existing business, rather than inventing something that stands alone outside and has its own um, sense of agency. And I think um, if you try to apply the startup thinking to the kind of entrepreneurial world, I'm sure there's stuff you can borrow, but essentially that those people have a day job and they. Um, often aren't encouraged to fail or to take risks in the way that um, you would need to to make something uh, succeed. So back to our, uh, don't worry, it's going to be okay, uh, Mr. Megacorp, um, or Mrs. Megacorp. Um, so what's happening at the moment? So that's the past. I think there's uh, some movement, change, movement happening where um, big organizations are saying, okay, we, we've tried all this stuff where we're trying to act like a startup, what can we do? Um, but there's still this idea that you want to be able to, be, to take advantage of this um, position where these potential unicorns are around. So the thing that's happening at the moment, um, and you might have seen some of this uh, in the press, um, the idea of a kind of startup factory um, backed by the big corporates of the world. And they come by def lots of different names. Um, company builder, startup studio, um, incubator probably quite familiar the corporate accelerator, the venture foundry, the startup factory. I mean, I'm sure we could be a bit more creative with what we call these things, but essentially it's smart people in a room who are motivated to create businesses with the backing of a corporate. So you're not creating a business unit inside um, a large organization. You're using the funds that a large brand has available to take that as an investment and basically create a series of businesses. So an example is Founders Factory. I was, meet, I was chatting with those guys just last week. Um, and they've just had backing from six large brands to, uh, for five years to create 200 startups. Um, so it's a room of people. It's like a design studio full of you know, the people we'd be familiar with, designers, developers, product people, UX people. But the, but the point at the output of it isn't to start, like, isn't to do um, campaigns or to get customers for the brand. It's to create a business that the brand has an interest in and an investment in, um, and they're standalone entities. So I thought I'd walk you through it so that you can, you can um, get an idea about how it works. The core principle here is uh, around prototyping um, and uh, UX people prototype all the time, um, this is kind of taking it to a slightly larger uh, level and, uh, and putting in a bit of process around how you, how you prototype and discover problems that would be valuable to even focus on. Um, now, I, my background is I've done this a few times. So my last company was a startup studio. And for two years, we basically invented loads of stuff. Um, I had 40 Git repos on my uh, hard drive, um, and we turned 10 of those into live, functional startups that people were using. And then of those 10, we whittled it down to three that were then making revenue, and we tried to kind of turn those into standalone businesses. Um, so that's the model. You start with loads of experimentation, you narrow it down using some kind of funnel approach, um, and then out the other end, hopefully, um, you, you end up with these businesses you've made. Um, at least that's the theory. Um, it's a bit more complicated than that. Um, 
So for a corporate, you know, if, if, if you've got a, um, a brand, then you'd probably have some idea of your industry, what you're good at. So the, t the top end of your funnel is loads of observations about your users or your customers or the industry, and you'd pop all those ideas in, and you'd have to have some process around filtering them. And the problem here is that a lot of people think that um, just thinking up a good idea is a great, is a great starting point. And actually, what I've learned is you don't start with ideas. Um, uh, having done this a couple of times, um, indeed, last year I was helping Land Rover set up a studio using this process. Um, the idea is you start with spaces of interest, kind of areas that are constrained by some observation around the industry that um, a company is interested in investigating. And then you set about kind of validating and testing uh, in those spaces. So as an example, with Land Rover, we were looking at car sharing. Was there an opportunity for Land Rover to be able to offer a sharing service for neighbors to borrow each other's cars because cars sit on the street 95% uh, of the time unused? So that was the opportunity. And you're constrained by car sharing, the UK, possibly Land Rover owners. Okay, So those are your three constraints. And then what you do is you set about validating to see whether any of that can work before you, kind of in the classic double diamond, you go wide, you try out loads of stuff before you narrow down on, yep, this is the solution we think we're going to get to, and before you then develop it into something. Um, so I'll go back to my ephemerals. Um, so basically, you fill up that space with potential things you might want to investigate. Um, and over a period of, say, six weeks, three months, you design tiny little high-resolution user experience uh, tests to see if people really do have the behavior you think that they would need to have to support the idea that you've got a business idea there. So you've got this space, and you basically try out loads of little things in the space over a period of weeks. And over that time, you're building up a massive wiki. You're just documenting every experiment. You're testing stuff out. Some of them die. Some of them win. And you end up with, like, one of them, maybe a few of them emerging as like, ah, this looks like we've got some evidence here. You know, actually, this car sharing thing, if you remove the Land Rover bit and you turn it into insurance, suddenly I think we've got a good idea. And actually, that's what happened in this case. Um, so then you, at this, you've, got, you've kind of gone wide and you've tried out loads of stuff. And at the end of your six weeks or three months of experimentation, you've got a wiki. You've done loads of tests to see if you've got anything there to support your potential new business idea, um, and it's decision point. Um, and the way that the corporate-backed um, approach works is usually there's some kind of decision point from a large organization or some stakeholder that goes, yes, good to go. And that's where it's really powerful to have the backing of a large company, because they can then back the next six months of development with their cash. So they'll just go, brilliant, team's ready, here's six months of money, go and build it. And, th and your, your rocket um, boosters kick in, but only if they like the idea. Um, so for me, I, I think one of the things I learned is you have to chuck it all away. Like no, no prototype goes, code goes from that point to the development process. The entire first stage is to learn and to de-risk the uh, thing you really want to build um, before you go into the kind of second part of the diamond. And I won't talk about that too much, actually, because that's like build, measure, learn, startup theory, and I'm sure you've all heard and read about that before. Um, but it's all about um, experimenting and de-risking um, a potential approach before getting investment behind you uh, and then assembling your team. And actually, because of this approach of having lots of people in a room, you've got the team in the room and you're able to get going immediately. And I think there's something really positive uh, here um, for the way that we might uh, be approaching building new products and services uh, because this is far less wasteful than 100 entrepreneurs going to loads of pitch events and trying to get in invest investment behind them uh, when actually this de-risks and removes a bunch of the failure and stresses people out a lot less, to be honest. It's a much more enjoyable process than uh, you know, hawking your in investment deck around uh, London. So a thing that emerged from uh, the whole uh, process of doing this a few times is um, you, 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 kind of, you kind of look at these things like, oh, it's testing all the time. You, you, you don't have this conviction. Like, can you really uh, say um, in any of these ideas whether you've got a passion for the thing that emerges as the, as the real solution? So having tested a load of stuff out, you find that actually the thing that you need to build at the end is, has, bears no resemblance to the idea that went in the beginning. And maybe you don't care about it at that point. Uh, maybe it's not the thing you wanted to build in the first place. Um, I, th I thought I'd give you an example of this. Um, 
Uh, the, you're all familiar with the QWERTY keyboard. Um, I, uh, I don't think this is true, but it's a good story. Um, it's kind of one for the pub, I think. Um, the, it's the, the, say, the, the story goes that the reason we have QWERTY UI up as the characters on the top of the keyboard is so that the people who were demoing the typewriters when they first came out could write the word typewriter on the top line. Um, and I, I, just, I don't really believe that, um, but it's a, it's a fun one to think about, like optimizing for the wrong thing. Um, <laughs> so, uh, but optimizing is what we need to do. We need to A-B test and test things out to arrive at the right solution. Um, and uh, a guy called Colmack has invented this keyboard arrangement by analyzing the, the stretching of your fingers to see how much, you have, so much energy you have to put into typing, and then has remapped the letters to minimize it for the English language. So this, changing your keyboard layout to this, and you can on any, on any computer, uh, reduces your strain. Now, that's the optimum solution, but the, the solution we have today is this old one that's got stuck in place. And the problem is that you can end up um, uh, optimizing for this really quick win scenario rather than going for the real deep solution that would maybe come out of research. So I worry about this model and that maybe you're ending up with these kind of low-value things. So it's all about testing assumptions. Um, you come in with an assumption about what your solution might be, um, and um, you have a process for removing um, any, anything that is invalidated through experiments. Um, I mentioned uh, the kind of insurance product we built over that year. We had uh, a few products going through the, this process, and it was interesting that we started with car lending as our idea, like, could we get neighbors to borrow each other's cars? And what happened was we ended up with building an insurance product. Um, that just supported the fact that it's really hard in the UK to borrow someone's car because you can't get the insurance. So it morphed from, you know, profiles of your car, find your neighbors on a map, all of that, to, oh, just get insured. So the product was very different, and the user experience was radically different. But we tried out several along the way. Um, so that's the, that's the principle of it, um, building things to reduce risk. Um, uh, you're designing things not to really serve a user, but to serve the idea you're re reducing risk on a business, to test assumptions and increase your understanding of a problem space. Um, now, that sounds great, but it's really hard uh, knowing what, what thing to test, what your, your unknowns are, asking yourself that kind of, what are the unknown unknowns questions, uh, and having lots of meetings where everyone says, I don't know, let's test it. Um, it can get a bit wearing. Um, but the end of it is that we, uh, you hopefully uh, end up with a few ideas, a few products that have gone through this kind of funnel, this idea funnel, and out pop the other end are these businesses with six months of backing from a company, a team, like, sounds like a great way of making new businesses. Um, the team have a stake, um, like, maybe this is a, uh, an approach that, uh, you'll see, I think there is one company in Brighton who's got this model. I don't know the name, but you might want to um, uh, connect with them. I think uh, Danny was mentioning it. But um, also, you need to kill some zombies along the way. Um, not every idea through your process will work, and you need to have a kind of idea of how you kill things. Um, so, big question here is, will all this work? And um, I, I guess uh, we don't know. You can point to some big com uh, kind of big products that are out there in the market right now that have come through something like this in the past. Um, and there are, in the, there are independent ways that have gone before. Um, so uh, these guys, I don't know if you've seen them, they're called Front. Um, I use them all the time. And um, they came out of a, uh, an independent startup studio in France, um, started by a group of friends and experienced people. And basically, they took a similar approach. They tried loads of stuff out, loads of stuff out they filtered it down, they made some prototypes, they worked out what uh, got users excited, and then they spun out an entire new business that basically is a kind of everybody sees everything inbox. Uh, and I use this for my, uh, my company. Um, so it looks like, you know, there's a kind of new wave of these startup studio spun out businesses coming. Um, they're kind of large ephemerals that actually you don't chuck, they stick around and you maybe turn into these uh, valuable businesses. So the, um, the thing in all of this that I've learned um, is to pay attention to any opportunities around tech um, in, and in the market, looking around what's going on, what trends are happening. 
Um, timing is everything. Um, and one of the things that we learned when I was dealing with both Red Bull, Land Rover, and other companies is that you, if they've had an idea on the shelf for too long, actually it might have expired a bit. That, that maybe there was an opportunity when someone thought up that, that idea and investigated it. Timing is the number one um, uh, reason why a startup will get good traction or a, a product will get going. Um, a well-timed idea has a much greater chance of success than one that is um, too early or too late. Like you've got to get it, get it right. But the bit that's missing in all this is passion, right? It's all a bit dispassionate. Like, do you really care which idea comes through this funnel? I mean, it, it sounds great. I mean, I, I, you, can, you can see you can pitch this to the big guys and go, great, get behind it. But you know, we love this stuff. We live it. We live products. We want to make things that are awesome. Um, I don't know if I want to throw loads of stuff at the wall and go, oh yeah, that one's stuck, I'll just go and do that for the next five years of my life. Um, it's a bit me mechanical. So I'll give you the other side. This is my story. Um, so in all of this, you start realizing that this word passion matters. It really does. Um, and you start paying attention to little signals about where it's easy and where you're enjoying things. We've heard about happiness and enjoyment in our work, and I really think uh, you can only make a successful business if you care about the people who are using it and you put, you know, put care into your work, into the thing that it um, represents. Um, so while I was doing the, that big project for the last year, uh, my wife had been um, quietly building up a massive internet following. Um, she'd gathered like half a million people around her. Um, on Instagram and Pinterest and various places. Um, and that's because her passion was photography. Um, and uh, when you have a passion like that, it just comes out everywhere. You just keep on going and you're doing it in your spare time. And something I've realized in this studio approach is actually the spare time stuff might be where the really interesting stuff happens. Because looking back, I've been in four studios now, and I've seen, um, don't know if you've seen Lost My Name, a wonderful little children's book. It's a personalized book. Get, get this for Christmas. It's awesome. You get the child's name, and you, a, a book is generated with the child's name with a story in it. And that happened as a side project in a, in a studio I was in. And I've seen this repeatedly now, like the people who are working in the studio, trying out this, this kind of funnel approach, trying out this iteration, de-risking process, getting good at it, and then in their spare time, applying it. Um, so we took that approach and applied it to Emily's um, world, and that's a world where um, female entrepreneurs are um, struggling with this kind of... Um, kind of work-life mix that's happening, where um, it's great to have the potential to be able to work whenever you want, but how does it fit into your life? Um, how's, uh, like, how do you use tech to grow a, grow a brand or a blog? If you're a creative person, how can you make a living from, um, you know, from that, that creative passion you have in your spare time? Um, so we basically built a learning site um, as a tiny experiment, we, we set up a blog in an afternoon, uh, made a page on it saying, hi, we're doing a course about photography. Would you like to improve your Instagram? Um, and we got people paying for it um, almost immediately. That was like our first experiment. And then since then, it's grown. And um, now it's, it's makelight.com. Don't ask me how much the .com costs. Um, it's like, I think it's absolutely mad. Um, but um, we've now... Um, basically built an online community of um, female uh, micro-entrepreneurs who uh, want to turn their kind of passion into a, a source of income. Um, and we help them do, do that using online courses and useful tools. Um, and it's a, it's a wonderful experience because um, there's passion just built into what we're doing. Um, it's come from Emily's kind of desire. She needs to get this stuff out. She needs to build this. And my tech enables her to achieve that. So yeah, I quit, I quit what I was doing in May, and now I'm full-time. Our family is solely funded by this uh, website, um, and we're building it and, and growing it. So that the thing I, I, I struggle with in this kind of corporate incubator model is it leaves out the idea that there's smart people in a room and uh, working on side projects. And right now, everyone knows you can set up a, a site, you can get a prototype off the ground with a little bit of code, some cheapo hosting. It doesn't cost you a lot to get something going with some users and potentially build your side project into something that is significant. So I really would um, urge you to pay some attention to playing in your spare time. If, if, I know it's a luxury. Not many, many people have that luxury to be able to spend their time on this kind of stuff. Um, but maybe... We don't have to be unicorn factories. Um, like, we're trying to raise, raise some investment for Makelite at the moment, and 
our pitch isn't we're going to build a billion dollar unicorn out of this. We're trying to do this uh, in a way that we're building a community and build something that's um, aligned with our passion and what we want to uh, help happen in the world. Um, and maybe the end point isn't that we want loads of unicorns. Maybe we want lots of uh, us to be able to have fulfilled lives uh, and where we have our work mixed in a little bit with our spare time and our passion to be able to bring us some income. Um, maybe there's something there, because a lot of uh, companies that don't get funded, um, and you know, it's 90% of businesses, uh, do, do very well in a, in a bootstrap mode. So um, I'll leave you this, with this final thought that um, all of that, what I've just talked about just now around these kind of corporate-backed accelerators uh, is predicated on the idea that you're going the venture capital route and you'll, you'll eventually sell the business and there'll be a billion dollars everywhere. Uh, personally, I think that this is... You know, this, this is on the rise, and um, people have started realizing that actually there's other things you want to get out of work and life and business. So that's me. I'm Steph. If you want to chat to me about bootstrapping, I'm going to stick around afterwards. Um, but good luck with your side projects.